Dear Professor Schwab, it's always a pleasure to see you. And on behalf of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy at the University of Cambridge, it's an honor to speak with you today. Uh, Professor Klaus Schwab is, of course, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, which uh, is the international organization for public-private cooperation, and which for 50 years, uh, come next January, has been uh, committed to improving the state of the world by engaging business, uh, political, academic, uh, philanthropic, uh, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and uh, industry agendas. Since well before I was born, Professor Schwab has been uh, an intellectual pioneer uh, and uh, an astute connector of people, institutions, uh, and ideas. Uh, he wrote his first book about the multi-stakeholder concept in 1971 and has remained at the forefront uh, of our understanding of these issues uh, ever since. Uh, and you have, of course, sir, uh, been an innovator an institutional innovator par excellence and have created a number of impact oriented nonprofit initiatives, including, of course, the Schwab Foundation for uh, Social Entrepreneurship, which uh, you created with your wife in 1998, the Forum for Young Global Leaders uh, in 2004, in which I've been an honored to be a, a part of for, for 10 years now, uh, before my gray hairs, um, and the Global Shapers uh, community, which uh, you established in 2011. Professor Schwab, I think most people watching this today would agree that effective collaboration between individuals and organizations from across different sectors, including those in the social sector, has never been more important. Uh, and this is something that uh, you've been writing about, uh, advocating for, and indeed putting into practice for decades. And we've, as, we've, as we've recently witnessed, it sometimes takes a global pandemic to remind us uh, of the dangers of poor uh, collaboration and unilateralism. Earlier this year, you published COVID-19, The Great Reset, uh, which importantly explores what the root causes of the pandemic are and looks ahead to what a post-pandemic world could and should look like if we properly learn from our shortcomings. Are we where you would have expected us to be at this stage of the pandemic, uh, with, with case numbers still rising in many parts of the world, and looking ahead, as we embark on this decade of delivery towards the meeting the world's uh, sustainable development goals, do you genuinely believe that the pandemic will have a lasting impact on how people think about the imperative for multi-stakeholder collaboration? Thank you very much, uh, Bardo, if I may say so. And uh, we are very proud to have you engaged uh, so actively in many of our activities and Congratulations for the creation of this center, which can play a very unique role. Um, so time has come for such a center. Thank you, sir. Responding to your question, of course, um, the corona um, pandemic uh, probably in its impact can be compared with the situation we had after World War II. Um, many governments, uh, particularly in Europe, with the US and many other countries still are in the fighting mood. But um, we have to look and we have to design the post-corona era. And we know we will not come back to the old normal um, because the corona crisis or pandemic has accelerated a certain number of um, developments like particularly uh, the uh, use of technologies of the fourth industrial revolution but the pandemic has also brought to the fore deficiencies which we had in the system even before the pandemic pandemic hits the world i won't mention uh, particularly a lack of inclusion and a lack of sustainability. And the old system as we knew it um, couldn't have lasted for a very long time anymore without leading to major uh, uh, breakups, first tensions, uh, social conflicts, maybe even national conflicts. So the beginning of the next year is an ideal moment to um, sit back and uh, 
to design our future and we have to do it in a collaborative effort. Uh, see, and that's the whole philosophy of the World Economic Forum. Um, see, big challenges in the world cannot be addressed by business alone, by governments alone, by civil society alone, or by philanthropy alone. We need all uh, to unite in common efforts uh, to make the world more resilient, more inclusive, and more sustainable. On the subject of inclusivity uh, and the importance of engaging all actors, as you just mentioned, ac across the capital continuum, you know, I often refer to the to philanthropic capital as the forgotten child of the capital system, often playing uh, on the peripheries and in many parts of the world regarded with a high degree of suspicion, despite the fact that well over a trillion dollars in philanthropic capital is dispersed around the world every single year. What can we do to better engage philanthropic capital as a true partner uh, as, uh, alongside business capital and government capital in addressing our world's challenges? And for the aspiring philanthropists that are watching this, what do you think are the keys to creating successful collaborations between philanthropy, business, and government? First, it's very clear that in order to achieve the SDGs, we cannot rely only on public money. Uh, governments will be very challenged in the after Corona uh, era, uh, because uh, we will have uh, to build up our health systems and many other governmental tasks, uh, which we have uh, to fulfill. Um, now, we need um, certainly private money. And here the um, philanthropic institutions and philanthropic people uh, come to the picture. And, um, but I'm, um, um, let's say, very much arguing uh, for a new type of philanthropy. In the old world, and I remember I wrote an article for uh, Foreign Affairs five, six years ago, where I was quite critical about um, uh, philanthropy by just providing money and uh, not being really engaged. Today, uh, philanthropy should be in some way united with social entrepreneurship, which means that the people who provide the money also provide their leadership capabilities and they provide particularly passion if you want to succeed in something, I think there has to be a passionate soul behind. Um, I made myself the experience. Uh, I created uh, the World Economic Forum as a not-for-profit institution, but um, I also created together with my wife, the, as you mentioned, the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. And the most exciting uh, moments um, which we have, my wife Hilde and I, are when we discuss uh, the role model uh, social entrepreneurs are playing. So I'm, I'm very optimistic and uh, very um, enthusiastic about the role uh, philanthropic organizations can play, particularly if they are associated with young people um, whom we find now, um, people who have become reasonably um, rich uh, and uh, ask themselves what should be actually the legacy and they feel that they should contribute uh, to society uh, not by giving just the money but by exercising at the same time a high degree of social entrepreneurship which means engaging into the project um, and uh, which goes of course much more far beyond uh, providing the financial means. Absolutely. Uh, and, with, and that is very much in line, uh, yeah. Professor Schwab, as you know, with the mission and objectives of the Center for Philanthropy, yeah. which is really to move from, as you say, traditional philanthropy to much more strategic philanthropy focused on impact and to harness yeah. the, uh, the values and the increasing, I guess, convergence of values between the business world and the philanthropic world in order to demonstrating uh, solid impact and sustainable impact, uh, social as well as environmental 
as we as we jointly try and confront our global challenges. Um, Allow me to move to the uh, emerging markets, which, as you know, uh, is the focus of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy uh, in Cambridge. The top 30 fastest growing economies in the world last year were all uh, in emerging markets, and a lot of new wealth is being generated in parts of Africa, the Middle East, and developing Asia, with trillions of dollars in assets expected to be passed on from one generation to the other within the next decade. What impact do you think that these geographic and generational shifts could have on the global economy and society over the coming decade or so? And how do you expect that the World Economic Forum will adapt to cater for this? The year 2020 is a very important watershed, if I may say so, because for the first time, the GDP of Asia is higher uh, compared to the GDP of the rest of the world. And I think she shows us in a significant way how the geopolitical and geoeconomic situation has changed. So um, the emerging countries um, will have a major role to play. And uh, of course, uh, the World Economic Forum is not only following the trend, uh, we are engaged uh, and have played a major role in China in its opening uh, and reform policies. We have been engaged since many years in the Middle East, uh, in India since 40 years. We always were believers that um, the world uh, will move in a situation where everybody has to catch up. We cannot afford the world uh, where uh, people or countries are left behind. And of course, uh, it's great to see if this catching up is not a consequence of uh, what we call in the old world public aid, but it's a consequence of the force of young people in those countries acting as entrepreneurs, uh, building um, uh, new enterprises and very often um, jumping immediately into the age of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, of course, provides, um, uh, because it's a much more dynamic, it's a much more uh, soft based economy, service based economy, it provides um, young people uh, who are talented unprecedented ways to uh, jumpstart um, uh, new ways of uh, doing business. So um, actually, uh, we are uh, just now running um, our global summit uh, for the pioneers um, because the World Economic Forum and I'm very proud, doesn't want to be an aging organization. Uh, it wants to be a young organization. So in addition to the very traditional companies, which are part of the forum since many years, we always, and particularly now even more, we pay uh, special attention to the integration of entrepreneurial minds and what we call tech pioneers. And zooming in on uh, our youth, and our future leaders. Uh, how do you believe that the youth of today, including the next generation of socially conscious consumers and investors that you've been referring to, could change the way that the world thinks about business practice and philanthropic practice over the next half century? I wrote in uh, 73, actually in 71, 72, um, it's a book which first conceptualized uh, the concept of stakeholder capitalism which means that the core for economic progress is certainly entrepreneurial innovation. It's not the government. Uh, it's the individual entrepreneur who drives the economy, um, the, the entrepreneurial spirit. But um, it should be done in the context of not serving only, and particularly not serving only short term, uh, the expectations of the shareholders but serving all stakeholders. Now, this concept for many years uh, had difficulties to, to uh, prove um, its validity because 
Um, we have seen a world which was going fast, where uh, financial institutions, short-term um, shareholder um, capitalism played a very important role. But I think we are here again at a sea change. Um, we have seen it with the adoption of the stakeholder principles, practically the same, which I had presented in 73 by the US Business Roundtable. I will publish a book um, uh, later this year on stakeholder capitalism. Um, and it's not just a kind of passing fade, uh, of passing theory. No, um, because fundamentals have changed. And the fundamentals are that um, customers, young people, um, of course, and uh, employees, um, they don't want to be associated anymore as uh, investors or as customers or as employees with a company uh, which is not uh, doing good for uh, society. Uh, so there's a much bigger social awareness today and companies who do not practice stakeholder capitalism are on the wrong side of history. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I totally agree with you that the age of that zero sum game approach between profit and purpose is coming to an end. Uh, people no longer see it or less people, let's say, see it as a trade off between profit and purpose. And I think that that is uh, perhaps long overdue, but it comes at a very important time uh, and at the intersection of many challenges, uh, both, both global as well as local challenges. So uh, the fact that you've been championing this over the years uh, has been fantastic. And, and uh, again, I commend you and, and the World Economic Forum for doing that. You, you referred to the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, of course, as you mentioned in 2015, you, you drew the world's attention to the uh, impending consequences of what you coined at the time, the fourth industrial revolution. Five years on, do you believe that on balance technology is being properly harnessed for the broader social good of the world? It's harnessed and uh, of course with our um, center for the fourth industrial revolution, our network, um, with uh, locations now around the world, we try to make sure that those technologies are human-centered and serve really humankind because like most technologies, uh, they, the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution can do good, but they can do also bad things to humankind. Uh, what we have seen is how much uh, the virus has accelerated the development of the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. And I refer particularly to two areas. Just think of digitalization. Uh, if we look at the countries which are um, particularly uh, successful uh, in fighting the virus, of course, it's a tracing capability, which is a di digital um, uh, capability. And some think of the, of the vaccine. The vaccine, which was just announced, um, is based on a completely new approach, um, which never has been tested before or tried before, but which could be uh, the entry into a completely new era of uh, treatment, uh, not only of viruses, but all other diseases. So um, I, I think uh, uh, the fourth industrial revolution and those technologies, once the, the pandemic has um, passed away, um, I think our, our preoccupation will be very much with the potential of the fourth industrial revolution because um, in, in the old world, it was mainly the cost and to a certain extent the quality which determined the success of a company. So you had the supply chain and so on. In the new world, it will be the innovative capability uh, to be number one or to be nobody. So we will have much more race among companies, among countries um, to be really at this position, number one, 
otherwise to be in danger to lose out. And this, yes. by the way, requires um, if countries want to remain um, competitive, it requires uh, a complete overhaul of our educational systems. I think also here, uh, the pandemic has shown what can be done with uh, digital uh, means, but we are just at the beginning. And uh, again, I think philanthropic institution uh, have a noble task by um, devoting energy and uh, financial capabilities, particularly to new ways of education. I fully agree. And as with many things and phenomenon, I think the pandemic will only accelerate that change. Yeah. Uh, I, one, yes. If I may add, uh, Bardo, uh, we have done some research at the World Economic Forum, and you know, um, about half of the present workforce will need reskilling or upskilling during the next 10 years in order not to be redundant. Absolutely, which is why I think every institution needs to consider itself an educational institution today, not just homes, but also businesses. Otherwise, we stand no chance at being able to retrain, as you say, half of the world's population within a decade. Um, one final question, sir. Uh, one of the priorities of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy is to convene diverse voices from around the world, uh, and especially from the emerging markets, uh, to advance our understanding uh, and, and practice of strategic philanthropy and how it can be practiced more effectively uh, by maximizing impact. You obviously have a lot of experience in driving catalytic change. Uh, what have you found to be some of the most effective ways to elevate diverse voices uh, in the discussions convened by uh, the World Economic Forum and to ensure that these conversations actually lead to getting things done uh, and not remaining just as talking shops? I think the key here is uh, encapsulated into two words, truth and trust. Um, if I look at the World Economic Forum, we always tried uh, to, to find the truth. That's the reason why we have an enormous network of experts supporting us, uh, um, judging everything. And um, uh, yes, uh, let's face it. We are living in a world of diversity, and that's very good. We have different ethnicity, religions, and so on. We also have different values, but we have to preach um, our uh, different positions in order to come to common solutions. And that's only done by dialogue um, first. Um, uh, we go usually through three phases if we want to uh, achieve impact. So first is um, to define the issue. And here, uh, it can be done only by listening to having dialogue to see um, how everybody uh, interprets a specific issue and where possibly a common denominator is. And that leads us to the second phase, which is to find solutions. And here not to jump immediately into one solution, but to evaluate all possible uh, solutions and also uh, to think, particularly today in an interconnected world, to think of um, unintended consequences. And then there is the last uh, phase, uh, which is to implement uh, the most um, appropriate solution uh, through joint action. So the World Economic Forum in everything which, which we are doing we are looking at those three phases and we are designing the best approach for each of those uh, three phases. Very often, I have to say, we, we can go only uh, because uh, we are a multi-stakeholder organization. We are not a government with, uh, let's say, the power to implement uh, issues, um, but uh, we can provide solutions. And I just take, um, since everybody speaks about uh, the pandemic, I just take as an example, we have um, 
uh, warns the world since many years that a pandemic may uh, be in the making. It's a, what you call a black swan. Everybody sees it, but uh, we don't know when it's coming. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, we are very proud that uh, based on the process, uh, we created um, some ideas and uh, organizations like um, CP, um, we, Gavi, of course, the Global Alliance for Vaccination and Immunization of Children, uh, which plays a major role today, um, particularly will play a, a role in the distribution of the vaccines because they have the networks in place, but also GP, which was created 2016 in Davos, um, which is um, a mechanism to finance uh, the development of, of vaccines and which has done valuable work in co-financing some of the vaccines which are coming now on the market. So we are, I could enumerate, you see many of such examples where uh, the forum acted, I would nearly say like a midwife, um, but it, it leads me also to a remark. Um, uh, everybody today is uh, speaking about impact and the necessity to measure impact. But sometimes, um, and that's particularly true for uh, the World Economic Forum, you, you create the impetus to act. You may um, undertake an initiative, but then um, the implementation is left to the business community or to the government community sometimes in joint action. And um, sometimes it's very difficult to measure uh, what the real impact is. By the way, we try to measure because speaking about philanthropy uh, and having an, created an endowed together with my wife, the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, we tried and we asked a, an independent organization to measure actually the impact. And I'm very proud to say that we had a direct or indirect impact on the lives of over 100 million people. Incredible, no, really incredible. Dear Klaus, if I may, uh, there are not many people in the world that I know of today who have been actively influencing change on a global scale across at least three generations. My maternal grandfather uh, and my namesake attended Davos in the 70s. Uh, and since I've been attending for the past decade or so, I've borne witness to its strength as a platform of change. Uh, and as we approach the 50th year of this unique platform, I again congratulate you and Hilde uh, and of course the whole WEF community for continuing to champion your vision and mission and wish you always the best of success and good health. Thank you again, sir. And I look forward to seeing you in person in the not too distant future. Thank you very much, panel. And I look forward to nominate uh, your children, young global leaders. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you.